Um, so, some of you may recall that last week I mentioned the Greek Orthodox Church of St. Porfirios in Gaza. That's named for a 5th century saint who was a missionary and a bishop and ultimately a martyr. Uh, that church was being used as a shelter by Palestinian Christians and Muslims who had been driven from their homes because their homes had been destroyed and they had no other place to go. A number of you emailed me this week uh, about the fact that that church had been destroyed. The church itself has not been destroyed. But there was an airstrike, and that airstrike was intended for a building next door to the church that the Israeli Defense Forces said housed a Hamas command center. And that led to the destruction of a two-story building on the church property that housed over 100 refugees. 18 people were killed, including children. We call that military speak collateral damage. Innocent people always suffer the most in war. Always. Whether the Israelis by Hamas, who were murdered outright, in their beds, many of them, children as well, or Palestinians now, who are being targeted. But nonetheless, you can't have a target as, how do I say, as unseen as Hamas as almost as invisible as Hamas is, without there being collateral damage. Now that funeral was held two days ago, and I posted on St. Paul's Facebook page the fact that all 18 people were buried at once, uh, because there are no, how do I say, there are no services in Gaza. There's no water. There's no electricity, nothing. So that funeral was presided over by Metropolitan Alexios of Tiberias, who was and is the Bishop of Gaza. Now when we pray for peace in the world throughout the liturgy, it's precisely for these kinds of incidents that we pray. And I know anyone who has experienced any kind of combat knows this, but war is always a foretaste of hell on earth. Always. There are no exceptions. And even though we might say, I've heard it said World War II was a good war, uh, if you know anything about World War II, no war is good. Sometimes necessary, but not good. Never good. So some of you may have heard also that a movie that was made 50 years ago was just re-released. The Exorcist. Wow. I went to see that movie with my cousin Andrea in 1973. Whoa, ancient times, baby. We walked out in the middle of that movie, not because it was frightening, but because the special effects were so gross and disgusting, and also the movie was so ridiculous. Forgive me for saying that. But it was, and it is, ridiculous. Now, this morning, the sixth Sunday of our reading from the Gospel of Luke, we hear the story of the Lord Jesus entering the land of the Gadarenes. And he's greeted there by a crazed man who is described in the scriptures as demon-possessed, who was bound with chains so he couldn't hurt himself or others, who wore no clothes, who was buck-necked, as my grandmother used to say. He didn't live in a house but he lived among the tombs. And here, we shouldn't think of a modern cemetery, a cemetery, but rather an ancient one, where tombs were carved out of limestone rock like little mini caves, like the kind of tomb that the Lord Jesus would be buried in, but much, much smaller. But the point is, he lived among the dead, because in a certain sense, he was already dead, even though he was technically still alive. But his life had become a living death. Now when the Lord Jesus asks his name, he responds by saying, Legion. For many demons had entered into him, the scriptures say. Now you have to remember that 
In the ancient Roman army, a legion was 6,000 men. So here was a man who was already dead, but still alive. But he had been overrun by spiritual forces beyond his control. His mind and his heart had been shattered into 6,000 pieces. He is fragmented, disrupted, and overwhelmed. He is without a center. He's lost to himself. In fact, he's lost the fundamentals of his humanity. But notice what happens. The Lord Jesus heals him. He heals him. And here I'm going to make a long story very short. When the townspeople hear about this miracle, and they come out to see what's happened and to verify what they've heard about, they find a man who had before been crazed and demon-possessed, no longer naked, but wearing clothes. No longer crazy, but in his right mind, the scriptures say. And he's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Instead of living among the tombs of the dead, like he was before, he now sits at the feet of Jesus, who's the life of the world. Now, it's important for you to remember what Deacon Dan read today, and in particular, what he read about the reaction of the townspeople. The Bible says, Careful Viti, son. They became afraid. Now, I sometimes have people say to me, You know, Father, if I could see a miracle, just let me witness a miracle, I'd believe. I'd even start coming to church. People say that to me all the time. Do I, do I slap them up the side of their head? I want to, but I don't. Okay? But here people have witnessed something truly miraculous. And they know it's miraculous. It's not like they don't know. They know it's miraculous. And it leads them to being fearful. So much fear, as a matter of fact, that what they tell Jesus in essence is this. Get lost, get out of here, and don't come back. We don't want you here. We do not want you here. The Gadarenes are very clear. Now some people, like the Gadarenes, don't want Jesus in their lives because it would mean that they would have to look at themselves, examine themselves, to look at their lives really carefully and ask some important questions. Like, who am I? Who is God? What are my values? What do I live by? Who is Jesus anyway? And then, if they ask those questions and they're honest with themselves, they'd have to begin to change. Change is very difficult. You know, I know where all of you sit on Sunday. That's how I take attendance. You've thrown me off a little bit because of the scaffolding. But otherwise, I know. Okay? Change is difficult for everybody. But they'd have to live differently. They'd have to become different people. They'd have to at least try to live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ if they really took a look at themselves and figured out who they are and what they're called to be. It would mean no more lies. Christians speak the truth in love, St. Paul says. It would mean no more arrogance and conceit. Christians are humble and gracious. It would mean no more hatred or indifference to the plight of others. Only compassion, mercy, and love. It would need no more selfishness. It really goes against the grain of our culture because we all are taught from childhood to look out for number one. But rather for Christians to engage in a desire to love our neighbor as ourselves. No more greed. Only generosity and caring for people who are in need. No more drunkenness. Only sobriety especially sobriety of mind and heart with all the clarity and purpose that that brings to a person's life. Now you see, the issue is the Gadarenes did not want to change. They didn't want Christ. But you're here today because you want to change. You are declaring by your presence 
You want Christ in your life. You want him to sit on the throne of your heart and rule your life. You want him. You desire him. You want him to direct your life. So here are the questions that we need to ask ourselves today. Are we like the Gadarenes? Do we ever say, get lost, Jesus? I don't want you, baby. Are we serious enough to allow Christ to change us? Are we ready to have him transform us with all the difficulty and pain that may include? You know, C.S. Lewis once made the remark that sometimes people expect Jesus in their life. Oh, and it's like, he's going to do some minor repairs here and there. And then all of a sudden they discover that Jesus isn't just doing minor repairs. He says all of a sudden they're building, Jesus is building an addition to the house. He's knocking out walls. He's doing all kinds of stuff that you weren't ready for. That's who Jesus is. He does not want a piece of you. He does not want a part of you. He wants all of you. He wants all of us together as a people. So if we are ready to have Christ to instill in us a new vision of who we are as the Father's beloved children, if we're ready for that, there's no better place to be than here in this church on Sunday morning. I'm so glad that all of you are here. Good morning, everybody. God bless. Hallelujah.